The Conservative Party of Canada is in yet another transition as it seeks to elect yet another leader. We've had Andrew Scheer, we've had Aaron O'Toole, who our colleague Jonathan says is the answer to the question of who's worse than Andrew Scheer. The question is, who will be next and what can we do to help the process out? We'll be talking about that and more coming right up. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Pro-Life Guys podcast. My name is Peter, host of the show, and with me again is my good friend and wonderful co-host, Cameron. How are you, sir? I'm doing very well, thanks. How are you? I am doing fantastic. Thank you so much to each and every one for tuning in. We are two guys who are passionate about ending the killing of pre-born children here in Canada, and this podcast is dedicated to giving you the tools you need to change minds and save lives in our culture. Um, <laughs> I said it wrong, but uh, yeah, there you go. Um, our conversation today, we're going to be on the on the political side of things in our conversation today. Um, still a, a very key way for us as Canadian pro-lifers to be engaged, to, to, to work towards um, defending and protecting pre-born children. We often talk about what we can do on the streets. Now we're going to be talking about what we can do in the political realm. Before we do that, Cam, you have a few announcements that you would like to bring up before I introduce our guest today. Sure do. Two quick things. One, I mentioned last week, <clears throat> um, I am running a three-week um, apologetics course that is going to be a, a focus on some of the most common arguments that we hear. In-depth time for you to bring up whatever whatever you're encountering, whether it's online, whether it's in person, whether it's stuff that you're seeing or hearing or whatever. And then talking a little bit about conversational dynamics as well, how to make your conversations more approachable, more manageable, more um, effective and and winsome and whatnot. And so that's going to be from May. Uh, let me pull up my calendar again. I had it memorized, but I've gone and forgotten it now. So it is May 28th until June 11th, three times, three sessions. Sign up on our website, ProLifeGuys.com. Second thing is that we are scheduling our next quarterly roundtable. We got a ton of really good feedback from the last one. The focus that we're having for this upcoming roundtable is the history of Canada's pro-life movement. There's a lot of interest in where we've come from and how that's shaping where we're going. And so we're going to have a couple of legends of the pro-life movement come in. We featured a few of them on the show already. Um, but definitely sign up to be a Patreon supporter if you want to have an invite to that. Go to patreon.com slash prolifeguys. Again, you can find a link through our website too. But those are two on my end, Peter. Awesome. With that, I'll introduce the guests that we have on today. Scott Hayward and Alyssa Galob are the founders of Right Now, an organization that exists to nominate and elect pro-life pol politicians by mobilizing Canadians on the ground level to vote at local nomination meetings and provide training to volunteers across the country to create effective campaign teams in every riding across Canada. They are busy right now with the election coming up of the Conservative Party of Canada as we seek a new leader who will uh, run against Justin Trudeau, who we all know but don't love. And so this is our conversation with Scott Hayward and Alyssa Globe. Scott and Alyssa, thank you so much for taking the time and joining us on the podcast today. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Okay, so on the top of the show, I mentioned um, for those who are not aware of what's happening in the Conservative Party that we are once again going through yet another transition uh, to find yet another leader, uh, which hopefully will be far better than the previous leaders that we've had um, an actual, and an actual contender against uh, Justin Trudeau, the Liberal Party leader and our prime minister. But I wonder if you could share with us, uh, Scott, I'll, I'll pass it on to you. If you could share with us for a few minutes, uh, a bit of a journey of the Conservative Party of Canada for the last few years, just to give us a bit of an understanding for, uh, just to help us understand where we are today, why we got to where we are today. Yeah, sure, you bet, Peter. So basically what's happened is, um, you know, for the last five years, there have been three leadership races in the Conservative Party of Canada, including the one that's happening right now. And how we got there is that in 2015, in that general federal election, uh, Justin Trudeau took the Liberal Party of Canada from 35 seats to 184. So he took the party from third place in the House of Commons to a majority government, which has never happened before in the history of Canadian politics. And in the wake of that, Stephen Harper, who had led the Conservative Party of Canada at that point for over 10 years, 
um, you know, kind of the first leader of the newly merged party, their first prime minister, he had resigned because he won just under 100 seats, 99 seats. So that instigated a leadership race uh, that concluded in May of 2017 that saw um, Andrew Scheer be elected as leader of the party. Andrew Scheer then went into the 2019 uh, general federal election. He reduced the liberal majority government under Justin Trudeau from a majority to a minority. And he increased the number of seats in the House of Commons for the Conservatives from 99 to over 120. He won the highest number of votes ever for the history of the Conservative Party of Canada. And he also won the popular vote at just over 34 percent. But for a lot of people within the Conservative Party of Canada, particularly those who were not maybe of our persuasion, pro-life and social conservatives, uh, they decided that, hey, you know what, that's not uh, good enough. Uh, you got to go. And so under incredible pressure, Andrew Scheer resigned in December of 2019. So then that instigated a new leadership race, the second in the last five years in 2020. That's the one that saw Aaron O'Toole beat uh, Peter McKay, uh, typically uh, like predominantly on the shoulders of uh, pro-lifers and social conservatives through down ballot. I'm sure we'll get into that a little bit later. And he won that leadership race in August of 2020. He then went into an election a year later in September of 2021. He actually won fewer seats than Andrew Scheer did. Um, he won fewer votes and a smaller percentage of the vote overall. So basically, the Conservative Party of Canada was more or less in the same position, except a little bit worse. And he didn't resign under pressure. Uh, there were multiple you know, members of caucus and members of National Council that were calling for his resignation. Uh, different, you know, um, different interest groups out there that are involved in the Conservative Party of Canada, whether it be, you know, uh, firearms rights or farmers or pro-lifers, for example. Um, so <laughs> caucus actually had a vote under what's called the Reform Act. And they it was quite a, a large margin. I think it was 74 to 55 or something like that or 45. Uh, they kicked Aaron O'Toole out as leader of the party. So that happened in uh, February of this year of 2022. And now there's a new leadership race that we're in today. So this is the third leadership race in uh, the last five years. There are a number of candidates who have declared, uh, there's only one candidate that has met all the thresholds to actually be on the ballot. I'm sure there'll be obviously more than one. And so that is where we are today. Love it. Thank you, sir. And, and Alyssa, I want to throw to you. So I, um, I'm sure both of you guys are, are super politically minded. You're going to hate me for saying this, but I remember when I turned 18, I, I think it was when I turned 18, I was looking forward to voting. And in the span of like one year, I feel like I voted in two municipal elections and a provincial election, and a federal election, like voter fatigue set in. It was like, I'll, I'll be fine never voting again. This, this was such a hassle, waiting in lines, all this kind of stuff. And I'm sure that, like you said, there's three leadership elections in five years there might be some kind of voter fatigue of like, do we really need to go through this again? Is it worth it? Whatever. Alyssa, why would you say, like, would you say that this is a really important thing to get involved? Or is this just like you guys get involved in every leadership election? If it's really important, why is this one in particular really important? Why should pro-lifers not be the ones, if anyone, getting fatigued by this whole leadership rigmarole, but rather invigorated and excited about this upcoming leadership nomination? Yeah, I mean, I would say I'm even more fatigued than the average person because the last time there was a leadership race, I was pregnant. And then <laughs> this time there's a leadership race, I am pregnant again. So um, and it's always near the end of the pregnancy that uh, we really need to go for it gold here. But um I would say that, you know, in other leadership races, and we've been involved provincially and federally, we always rank our ballots and send them out and interview each candidate. And sometimes there are candidates that better than others. And we encourage people to vote for the best candidate and rank their ballot. But in these, in the last leadership race, and specifically in this particular leadership race, there is a candidate that, in my opinion, far surpasses any others. Um, you know, she is a, a very strong pro-life advocate. She appeals to people across different party lines. She appeals to red Tories, to progressives. She appeals to SOCONs, to new Canadians, to women voters, all the types of voters that the Conservative Party currently needs to win and lost last election. And so for me, as a pro-life, as a pro-life activist, as a woman, I think that it's very exciting that Leslie Lewis is running. And 
that to me is such a motivator that I want to do everything in my power through right now, but just as a Canadian citizen to get her to win so that we don't have to go through another leadership race for a really long time. <laughs> yeah. So Leslin Lewis is on the ballot, as you mentioned, but there are a number of other people who have indicated their uh, desire to be on the ballot as well to run for the leadership party, but also for prime minister. Uh, Leslin's on the ballot. We have Pierre, uh, whose last name I can never uh, <laughs> I just don't know how to pronounce it. He's the economy guy. Um, we have a bunch of others, and uh, I'm starting to get my uh, inbox full of emails uh, asking for support. I hate when campaigns happen, per perhaps for that reason alone. Um, so, Scott, maybe could you share with us who can we expect to be on the ballot? Um, who are some people who have uh, indicated uh, their interest in being the Prime Minister of Canada? And what can we? what do we know about these folks? Sure. So let's take a look at the slate as it is right now and as we expect it to be. So just so people out there know, like, how does one become uh, a leadership contestant? How do they get their name on the ballot? You have to meet a few different criteria. Obviously, you have to be a member of the party. Then you have to get 500 current members of the party who have been a member for at least 21 days to sign a nomination form. And those 500 members have to come from... Uh, 30 different ridings in seven different uh, provinces or territories. Then you, by April 19th, I believe is the first deadline, have to submit a $50,000 deposit to the party. And then by April 29th, you have to submit a further $250,000 deposit to the party. So $300,000 altogether. So within a relatively short time frame, because I believe the race officially began on February 3rd, when Aaron O'Toole was ejected by caucus as leader of the party, um, you know, that, that's, a, that's a pretty short um, amount of time to, to meet all that criteria. And so uh, one person has met all that criteria thus far, Dr. Leslie Lewis, uh, who we already discussed. Um, and then the other ones that were expected to meet that criteria would be Pierre Poliver. Uh, there is Jean Charest. There's Scott Aitchison. Um, there is uh, Patrick Brown. And uh, Roman Baber are the are the ones who have um, met the first criteria, the fifty thousand uh, dollars. Oh, sorry, hold on. Patrick Brown actually hasn't met that yet. He hasn't even, from my understanding, submitted his application, though it's expected that he would and probably meet the criteria. So those are the people that are uh, known as approved candidates. They kind of met that first threshold that needs to be met as of April nineteenth. Then you have a number of other candidates uh, who have declared their intention to run, but uh, haven't met that initial threshold yet. Um, so you have Mark Dalton, who's a pro-life member of parliament from uh, suburban Vancouver. Um, you And he was first elected in uh, 2019, and I believe he was in uh, BC Liberal MLA uh, provincially. Of course, the BC Liberals, much like the Quebec Liberals, um, is an amalgamation of federal uh, liberals and federal conservatives that just kind of go under the liberal name. Uh, then you have Leona Alislav. She's a former member of parliament from the GTA, the Greater Toronto Area. She actually was first elected in 2015 as a liberal member of parliament under Justin Trudeau, part of that big uh, election of his that uh, he stormed to majority government with. And then in, I believe, uh, September of 2018, she actually crossed the floor uh, while the House of Commons was in session. I've never seen anything like it before. In the middle of a point of order, she had crossed the floor from the Liberals to the Conservatives. Um, and then you have a, a few other kind of candidates. You have Joseph Burgo, uh, who's a uh, pro-life anti-vaccine uh, mandate candidate from Saskatchewan. Um, you have Grant Abraham, uh, who is also a, uh, I believe is a pro-life anti-mandate uh, candidate uh, from, I believe, Ontario, but, but don't quote me on that. So you have a few different other candidates there. So you have like the different tiers as you're seeing right now. Um, and that's kind of the lay of the land right now. So Pierre Poliver, he's been a, a member of parliament for the riding of Carleton since uh, 2004. He was elected when he was 22 or 24 years old. So he spent basically all his adult life in elected politics. Um, he's been a critic uh, for a very long time, both when the Conservatives were in opposition in 2004 and now. Uh, he was a junior minister of state for a little bit toward the end of the Harper government. His his big kind of shtick is, is running on um, against the carbon tax and against inflation. Uh, Jean Charest Ray is seen as kind of the red Tory, kind of part of that old guard in the mold a little bit of uh, how Peter McKay ran last time. 
you have a lot of people kind of from the old wing of the of the old progressive conservative party that are backing him. Uh, so he's he kind of represents that uh, that wing of the party. Patrick Brown is a former leader uh, provincially of the conservative party, the progressive conservative party of Ontario. Um, as many people in Ontario and probably outside of Ontario remember, he lost his leadership because uh, he was accused of uh, improprieties with uh, younger women regarding alcohol and uh um, flirting with, um, you know, some stuff of sexual nature. So uh, he had to resign as leader in January of 2018. And he was quickly replaced with Doug Ford, who then, of course, went to win a big majority government in Ontario. Looks like he's probably on track to do the same in June of later this year. And then Roman Baber uh, was elected under that uh, big majority government of, uh, of uh, Doug Ford um, in uh, the GTA. And he uh, he actually got ejected from caucus because he was against uh, all the vaccine mandates that were coming in with the provincial government in Ontario. And so that is uh, what he's running with. So that's kind of your lay of the land. And those were the candidates as they appear right now for uh, this leadership race. Love it. Thank you, Scott. And and I, I want to get both of your takes on this. But I'm going to throw it to you first, Alyssa. That, um, so, and, and we'll talk about the ranked ballot in a moment. And, and we can spend a little bit of time possibly of, as to these other candidates that you mentioned, Scott. But Alyssa, obviously you mentioned um, the absolute winner that Leslie Lewis is, uh, Dr. Leslie Lewis. And I'd love to get, let, let's dive a little bit deeper into why we should be fired up about her. Because I feel like there, there's probably sentiment that unfortunately you guys run into all the time that would simply liken her to an Andrew Shear of like, you know what? Sure, privately she might share all of my beliefs, but she's probably going to turn out to be a wet noodle and not actually help us at all. Why should we care? Um, Pierre Polyver is actually going to make something happen on the the carbon tax, whatever. What gets you fired up, Alyssa? We'll start with you and then I'll throw it over to Scott afterwards. But what gets you fired up about Leslin and why is this somebody that we can have more confidence in than maybe an Andrew Shear? and she goes beyond, um, it, it's not like she's crazy pro-carbon tax or anything. Like why should pro-lifers be excited about her and why should they be able to not only rank her pro-life conviction above potentially other economic stuff, but also consider potentially some of the economic stuff? What, what is it that gets you fired up about her? Well, I think that Leslie Lewis is probably one of the most principled politicians that I've ever seen. I think there's two types of politicians. There are those that are principled that get in, and then there are those that kind of are more narcissistic, that want more popularity, that want more power, that go into politics. And oftentimes the ones who um, are principled turn towards the narcissism, and then some of them stay the same, and some of, some of them actually want to do some real good. But um, I think that Leslin uh, is one of the most principled politicians that I've ever met. And I don't see that changing whatsoever. It goes against her whole character uh, to go with the, what, what the common uh, opinion is. But the way that she approaches her principles is something completely different than anything we've ever seen before. Because we've seen lots of pro-life politicians in the past, you know, put forward bills and be able to, you know, in, in a, to defend them to a certain extent, but the way that Leslin does it uh, appeals to such a more broader base. Uh, and for her leadership campaign, she she runs on pro life principles, specifically under a no hidden agenda platform. And those pro life principles, polling wise, have the majority of Canadian support, so they're easily defendable. Whereas you know other. Other pro-life politicians may have run up against roadblocks or not been able to answer certain questions. Leslin knows her stuff. And if anyone watched her during the last leadership race, when she was confronted on any mainstream media uh, about these issues and about just general social conservative issues, you know how, I mean, I mean, we've all been in interviews when interviewers kind of want to get the last word, and then move on. So like they won the argument. Leslin would never let that happen. Like, for example, she was on an Evan Solomon interview and she, and he did that. He tried to just get the last word and move on to something else. And she interjected and it wasn't confrontational and it wasn't awkward. And she said, actually, no, Evan, and then continued on. And she was the one who get, got the last word and he was just kind of stuttered and then moved on to the next thing because he wasn't used to that. 
And I think that that's the pushback that we really need as social conservatives, but just as conservatives in general, even when she was in the general debate with the other three candidates last leadership election, they actually, there was a video that was out because every single candidate kept saying, I agree with Dr. Lewis. I agree with Dr. Lewis. I agree with Dr. Lewis. And it was just like two hours of them sort of agreeing with her, um, which was, you know, again, she, she, because of how many people ranked her as second on their ballot from the McKay campaign to the Sloan campaign, which were far different campaigns, it just showed how much of a broad appeal that she has. So yeah, maybe some of the old guard progressives might get excited about dropping the carbon tax. Maybe that's what really keeps them awake at night and keeps them, you know, keeps that adrenaline going. But for me, it's being principled, it's being able to defend those principles, and it's being able to be a candidate that I think would be the star going up against Justin Trudeau. Like we've never seen anything like it. And we did see a glimpse of it in the House of Commons recently um, when she did, uh, when she spoke during question period and he answered and he was, I think, taken aback a little bit and stumbled on his words, which is pretty common. But I I think it would just get better and better uh, if she were to do that more regularly. Well, one thing I want to talk about real quick about this is consistency, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, Pierre Polliver has been an elected politician for basically all his adult life uh, since 2004 for almost 20 years. And um, so he has a bit of a track record and that track record isn't necessarily 100% consistent. So when someone like uh, Luz and Lewis... um, getting her in the House of Commons is is such a breath of fresh air because she actually stays consistent with her principles. So leading into her election uh, to the House of Commons, you know, she was against um, uh, a lot of the vaccine mandates uh, and things of this nature. And she was consistent in that, whether she was posting, whether on on social media through Facebook or Twitter, whether she was writing about it in the National Post and interviews. Uh, She was the first MP to to basically welcome the idea of the trucker convoy and the idea of the trucker convoy convoy being getting rid of the federal and provincial uh, vaccine mandates people I mean people were losing their jobs and and all, all this sort of stuff it seems like like years ago it was just a few months ago because basically all those mandates are gone um, you know Pierre Polliver was late to that game uh, I, I believe that there is a a, a, a picture of an interaction between a constituent of uh, Pierre Polliver's and uh, Pierre's office where basically ladies saying like, listen, can you please stand up in the house and get rid of these vaccine mandates? Because, you know, my my husband or my neighbor or someone like that is about to lose their job. And uh, the, the response from Pierre's office was, uh, this was our policy in uh, the election the other month. And, uh, you know, I encourage you and everyone else to get vaccinated. So it's basically like too sad, so sad. Bye. That was November of 2021. And then all of a sudden, February of uh, 2022, when the popular mood is starting to change because of people like Les and Lewis was pushing it in the House of Commons, in media and social media, then he jumps on the bandwagon. You know, he's he's the freedom candidate. Uh, and, you know, he's he is supposedly he's out there saying, you know, freedom for this, freedom for that. Yet um, when it came to Bill C-4 and the previous House of Commons, which was... Um, or pardon me, no, it was in this House of Commons, which was uh, the conversion therapy bill, where, you know, parents and pastors or whatever else can't now even have uh, those types of conversations with children, with minors, with their, with their own children. Um, there's Pierre Polliver. Um, it, he was in favor of the bill. He voted for its predecessor bill in the previous parliament, Bill C-6, which basically did the same thing. So, you know, his freedom uh, only goes so far. His freedom is probably only for the things that he believes in. That is not not a consistent message. Um, you know, and for pro-lifers who are probably most people listening to this podcast, I would hope most people who are hearing my words to the in this podcast are going to vote for the most winnable pro-life candidate. That isn't Pierre Polliver. Um, Pierre Polliver voted against Bill C-233 in the previous parliament. That's the bill from Kathy Wagenthal, which would have legally restricted sex-selective abortion, which is an odious practice. I think there's roughly about 500 sex-selective abortions, according to the Canadian Medical Association Journal 
journal that occur in Canada every year. So, I mean, I know, I understand we're not talking about a huge, huge number, but, you know, it at least re- would reduce the abortion rate by a, a little bit. It's something that has a super majority support right across Canada, 84% plus, uh, over 80% in Ontario, over 80% in Quebec, 61% of those that voted for the Bloc Québécois in 2019 said they'd be more likely to vote for a political party that would legally restrict sex selective abortion. It's uh, it's a very high, uh, similar numbers for um, women in young women in the uh, age cohort of 18 to 35. Like th- this is a huge popular policy. It's official party policy of the Conservative Party of Canada. Pierre Polliver voted against it. So, you know, when we talk about consistency between someone like, you know, Leslie Lewis and Pierre Polliver, you have that with Leslie Lewis. You've seen that through her political career as nascent and as, um, as uh, uh, young as it may be compared to Pierre's because she's actually done stuff in the real world, in the private sector. Pierre, not so much. You know, he started voting pro-life, then he started voting pro-abortion. He was all for mask mandates and vaccine mandates. And then, you know, when the, the numbers started to change, quickly he started to change. And then finally, and then I'm going a bit of a rant here, then I'll you know shut up. But the one last thing I'll say is like, okay, so Pierre's, you know, against inflation, Pierre's against the carbon tax, Pierre's, you know, pro pipeline and, and wanting to um, restrict government fine, uh, uh, deficit financing, like, on what any of those policies does Leslie Lewis or frankly, any other leadership candidate besides maybe Patrick Brown, and perhaps Jean Charest differ, like, you're going to get the same thing with Leslie Lewis on all those points as you were with Pierre Polliver. I have a whole other thing about inflation too, and we can get to that later. It, it just it just drives me insane, some of his talking points on it. But anyway, um, I'll leave it at that. Maybe I'll just add that, like, uh, continuing on with the Pierre Polliver talk is that every cultural issue or every type of issue, he always brings it back to inflation too. Like, he's such a one-trick pony. For example, there's an internet censorship Bill, um, that's being put forward by the liberals. And when Pierre talks about it as his ra- at his rallies, he's saying the liberals want to censor us so that they, we can't talk about inflation or about the economy. Like, no, that's not why they're trying to censor us. Um, yeah. And he always... Has, like, Alyssa, has anyone on Twitter or like Facebook or has anyone in the history of any social media been banned for talking about inflation? Yeah, it was just... And there was one other example, and I don't know if I if you remember Scott, but it was something completely like it was a completely different cultural issue. And he, oh, I know what it was after the um, in the House of Commons when they were talking about the Emergencies Act, he was he was piled on by the reporter saying, what did you think about Justin Trudeau invoking the Emergencies Act? And he said, Justin Trudeau is purposely invoking the Emergencies Act to detract from inflation. Like, no, that's not why he's invoking the Emergencies <laughs> Act. So yeah. everything it's like his his one issue that he knows everything about, but he brings every other issue back to it and he cannot properly voice any type of proper argument in favor or against certain policies without bringing it back to inflation. And I find that so turn off. I just, I just have to have one last thing and then I promise this is it and then we'll stop <laughs> commandeering this. I just have to talk about this inflation thing because um, some of your uh, listeners may or may not know. Uh, before I got involved in full-time pro-life politics, uh, I was in public. Uh, I was in public practice as a chartered professional accountant. That's my designation. That's that's my background. And in order to get that designation, I had to get a bachelor of business administration degree. Part of that degree, my minor was in economics. So, like, I'm not an economist. That's not my major. But like, I speak with it with at least a little bit of knowledge. The quickest way to fight inflation, and this is not popular, which is why you'll never hear it from Pierre Polliver. Basically, the quickest and almost the only way to like seriously reduce inflation is to raise interest rates. And the reason why politicians don't want to talk about that is, A, because in this country, that is monetary policy. So it belongs to the Bank of Canada, which has a contract with the federal government. You're not supposed to touch that legally. And B, by raising interest rates, you're raising, obviously, the rates of mortgage mortgages. Uh, and a lot of people are, are basically living paycheck to paycheck who've just purchased more uh, houses, especially in places like Metro Vancouver and uh, the GTA, the Greater Toronto area. So when he goes on and talks about inflation, uh, he never actually talks about like basically the one and only solution to inflation, which is to raise interest rates. And it's something that like with my very limited knowledge, granted, but at least a little bit of it from my educational background, just drives me up the bloody wall. It is just so shallow. 
Scott, I have to, I have to say, um, don't promise the audience that you're going to, you're shut your mouth because, uh, we love when you jump in, we love the contributions you give. So, um, but I think this is really helpful to talk about peer. I know there are a lot of people in my circles uh, that I interact with, and I know others uh, interact with something similar. Um, people who look at Pierre and think this is our guy. Um, he's strong on the economic issues. He's strong on finances. He's strong on inflation. Um, he's strong on, you know, all of these, these sort of freedom related issues as well. And, um, you know, pro-life stuff is, is important. But if we don't have someone like Pierre in, then we might not have the freedom to talk about pro-life issues. That's sort of the justification mm -hmm. and the theory. So I think, uh, not I think, uh, I, I believe, I know that the things that you just shared are, are particularly important for us to understand this leadership race, putting Pierre side by side with Leslin and seeing how, on, yeah, a lot of these issues, consistency is key, but also Leslin uh, will do the same thing that Pierre is promising to do, but will do far more things for social conservatives like the issues on, you know, abortion and, and uh, Bill C4 cha challenges and problems that just came up as well. So thank you so much for that. Um, I'd like to, to sort of divert to where we can go as social conservatives, just regular folks um, seeking to do something for the conservative party. We have some sort of FAQs later on as well um, for those who identify as conservative, but are not uh, very keen on the conservative party of Canada, which um, Isn't that all of us? Yeah, that's right. It, that's right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Aaron O'Toole. <laughs> yeah. So what needs to happen now? We well, maybe not now, but once we see a ballot um, and, and uh, once we sort of have a date set, maybe there's a date set, but for uh, electing the leader of the conservative party, what are some of the steps for us as conservatives? What can we do to help out? Um, I mean, where do we where do where does someone like me fit into this picture? Well, I will say that the different candidates have different strategies. And I was kind of thinking about this and writing about this this morning because Pierre's strategy is very much an online strategy. It's to do these events, to post these massive pictures with massive people um, and and to get his picture out there, to get YouTube videos out there, to get you know all these quick talking points, these quick videos out there. And I'm not going to say whether it's effective or ineffective, but that's his strategy. His strategy seems to be less about signing up new members, more about really pitching himself to the current membership base and just taking it over, winning the leadership that way through a, more of an online campaign. And then we have other candidates uh, like Leslin who are focusing on membership sales and bringing new members into the party. And then you see pictures of Patrick Brown and Patrick Brown has always done a good job of getting into the ethnic communities. You know, they called Jason Kenny Curry in a hurry because he would always go to all these different ethnic, commu ethnic communities and they loved him. And he was able to, um, you know, voice his, the conservative principles that way. Patrick Brown is very similar to that. Um, so focusing in certain areas of the GTA because he's a mayor of Brampton and getting into those communities. So, but the, the the one kind of thing that I hear all the time is like, what's the point of even getting involved or buying a membership because like Pierre's taking off with it. So like, you know, I, I could do this, but it looks like he's going to win, but that's their strategy. Their strategy is to make it look like it's going to be this coronation. He has this crazy amount of support. No one can touch him, but numbers speak louder. You know what it is, Alyssa? You know what it is? It's a shock and awe campaign. Yeah. And and um you know, I'm I'm a little bit in awe of it, but I'm not at all that shocked about mm -hmm. it. Yeah, exactly. And it and it is working because he's trying to promote himself like, look, I have an arena full of people. Why would like no one else is going to come close to touching me in the leadership race? So, um, and and people are starting to think that way. So the the message that I think we want to portray here is that membership sales do play a big part in it. And so just because P Pierre may be uh, a favored candidate right now with the current membership doesn't mean that he's automatically going to win the mem the leadership race. You know, the candidates that sign up new members that get those members out to vote are, are ultimately the ones that are going to win. And the the leadership race isn't until September. Like that's a, a few months away. So a lot can happen during that time. But right now, until June 3rd, we have to sign up as many members as humanly possible. Um, and that's just conservatives that want to see a fresh new perspective, a different leader, not somebody who is a clone of the other three, um, which would be Leslie Lewis or, or just social a social conservative in general. And the the way that we've we as right now have been pitching that is to 
get riding captains or membership sales captains, whereby basically they just reach out to their personal pro-life contacts, whether it's five people, 10 people, 50 people, everybody has a different social circle, uh, and just ask those people to sell to buy a membership and then keep track of how many they sell. And honestly, if one pro-life person sells five memberships and then somebody from there sells five, exponentially, it does make a difference. And there's 338 ridings across the country. It doesn't have to be in a specific riding. It can be in a city, um, even helping in the province. Uh, it doesn't have to be mainly in like your area of Calgary, Southwest or whatever the case may be. So that's really what we're focusing on uh, at right now. So number one is obviously buying a membership and voting because that's going to make a big difference, but also becoming a membership uh, sales captain. Yeah. And, and it doesn't have, you're right, Liz, it doesn't have to be like in, in specifically in your riding. Like for example, like uh, let's say uh, like I have a few friends, for example, that are uh, f- their families or they themselves are from Northern Iraq. And so they're uh, Chaldean Catholics. And so they're connected to the Chaldean Catholic community, uh, which has different pockets, whether it be in the GTA or Montreal, even in Saskatoon and in Calgary, a little bit in Vancouver. So like you, your, your contacts might be, you know, across Canada, your contacts might be, you know, just, for, for example, at your local church, if you go to some sort of religious community every week and you're pro-life and you want to see the Conservative Party of Canada, like any other political party, become more pro-life and have a pro-life leader, then go and talk to all the pro-lifers at your religious community, at your parish, at your congregation, at your um, synagogue, you know, your mosque, your um Gurdwara, like temple, like where, wherever it is you go, go and talk to all those pro-lifers. Like if you sit down for 20 minutes, go through your Facebook contacts, go through your phone contacts, you'll be able, you're going to be able to put together like a good solid list of probably at least 50 people that you could easily reach out to through a text, a phone call, Facebook message, you know, email, whatever. You're going to be able to sell uh, a good number of memberships real real quick and that it does make a difference and that is the advantage that someone like les and lewis and maybe uh, to a lesser extent uh patrick brown maybe mark dalton if he can uh get meet the thresholds again to the race those are those are huge advantages that frankly someone like pierre poliver doesn't have but well pierre does bring many strengths to the party like like don't get me wrong like like he's <laughs> he's not an empty suit like he, he does bring many strengths to the party but on our values, on our issues, which most people listening to this podcast would agree with, he doesn't, he, he's not an ally on those issues. He's not going to do anything for us. He's going to be the, another clone of uh, Harper, which basically saw nothing get accomplished besides uh, temporarily uh, defunding abortion overseas. So, you know, you, you can make a difference. This is kind of the sleeping giant of this leadership race. And just one last thing on this regarding like, you know, oh, you know, what's the point if, if it's a juggernaut? Well, a lot of people thought that last time with Peter McKay when he first entered the leadership race in January of 2020. And then over time, over the weeks and the months as the campaign rolled out, it quickly became that that, that wasn't the case. Um, and then I remember last time a lot of people thought like, oh, you know, Leslie Lewis, she's a nobody candidate. Yeah, she's great and shares my values or whatever. She's not ready. She doesn't speak French. She doesn't this. She doesn't that. And then lo and behold, when the votes actually came in, um, I think she out of like 170 whatever thousand votes cast, according to my calculations, she was just over 8000 votes shy in specific ridings and 149 specific ridings across the country from getting enough points to be on that final ballot. And having been in the room myself, the counting room for like the 16 hours that we were there, I can tell you that of all those ballots I saw that had to be recreated that had either Aaron won or Peter won, there was a lot more Lesland two than either of those other two on those ballots, especially for the Peter ones from Atlanta, Canada. So she was like a whisker away from being on the final ballot. And I'm quite convinced mathematically that had she been on that final ballot, she would have won that uh, leadership race. So like, this is a woman who, who came into, for example, the 2015 election, um, less than a month before election day, because the candidate the running in that riding had to resign because there was a video of him taking a whiz into like a mug or something like that. Um, she had the second highest votes ever for conservative in that riding. And it's a Diane really weird Finney's- explanation. He was a contractor. <laughs> he was a contractor who was building a house and they on the house video they caught they caught him peeing in the household the house cup mug in the sink because the bathrooms aren't ready yet. 
<laughs> you're you're being too generous providing that much context, Alyssa. <laughs> Just um, so she, she, she came she came in with less than thirty days left, had the highest number of vote a second highest number of votes ever for conservative in that riding. She then ran in Diane Finley's old riding of Halman Norfolk in uh, the last autumn, the autumn in twenty twenty one. She had the highest number of votes for any candidate ever in the history of that riding. Like this woman is the actual political juggernaut. Pierre Poliver n- no fault of his own per se, but Pierre Poliver actually almost lost his seat in Carleton in the 2015 election. He came within a couple percentage points, 1,500 votes with, you know, 60,000 votes cast. That's not that big of a margin. So um, w- when people are talking about like, oh, she doesn't really have a chance. She- she's not this, she's not that. I think that's all BS because looking at the numbers, which I'm big into, um, this 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 particular candidate is a very, very winnable candidate. Love it. And I, I, I absolutely want to impress upon the entire audience that exact point that this is a very winnable candidate. This is actually going to turn into something. I mean, the the hype, and I feel like a lot of conservatives have forgotten about the hype around the last leadership um, kind of election and that we're building on that, that yes, um, Pierre Polyver might have a lot of support coming up now, but Leslie's done this already. She's got a very good team put together, all that kind of thing. Um, and this is something that you don't have to be a crazy big politico to go into. I, I know that I've shared on the on the program, not only today, but like in the past, that, that I'm not super keen on getting more phone calls from the Conservative Party of Canada. I'm not super keen on getting more emails and all that kind of stuff. But like, straight up, let, let's think about what is at stake here and the minor inconvenience about getting an extra fundraising phone call that you're probably going to ignore anyways versus having a candidate that might actually move the needle on some of these important social things. Like, this is actually an opportunity. And I know that there's been a lot of disenchantment um, and maybe maybe it makes sense at some point to talk about how you guys keep hopeful in the pro-life movement after so much disappointment. But like, this is something that that should actually inspire hope. And and yet I want to pivot into a bit of one of those kind of FAQ sort of things. I'm sure that you guys have gotten a lot of it in the last kind of several years since the People's Party of Canada has come out. I'm sure that you've been getting it with regards to the Christian Heritage Party and whatnot. This idea that like, I don't even support the Conservative Party of Canada. Why should I buy a membership for a party that I'm probably not even going to vote for in the general election. Maybe you've got a rock solid CHP candidate. Maybe you've got a, um, whatever, a, a friend or, or maybe you run in the PPC party or whatever. I don't, I don't know, but like why even strategically, even if we're not right now trying to win people over towards the merits of the, the conservative party versus the CHP or, or people's party of Canada, whatever kind of thing, like you can take on a membership in this party and vote in this leadership and not actually vote for a conservative candidate, right? Like, I'm not crazy thinking that. Is that true? That's, that's, that's what happened to both Alyssa and I. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I'm a member of the Conservative Party of Canada. Um, for a member a, a while there, I think I was even a, a, not a member, but a supporter of the Liberal Party of Canada too, in case there was a leadership race happening yeah. there. But the, the fact of the matter is, is that there isn't a leadership race happening right now within the People's Party of Canada. I don't know if there ever will be. Um, there's not a leadership race within the Christian Heritage Party. There's not a leadership race in the NDP. There's not a leadership race in the Liberal Party of Canada, although those two seem to be now the same thing with their confidence and supply agreement. But there is a leadership race happening within the Conservative Party of Canada. The Conservative Party of Canada won the highest number of votes in the last two elections. It has the second highest number of seats. It's the most likely to form a government, mathematically speaking, uh, should uh, there be an election any time in the next well, I guess not until the next three years. So, um, you know, for me, like I, I voted in the leadership race last time, uh, having voted for uh, Leslin, of course, and, and then Derek. Um, and in my riding where I live, where my wife and I live, we didn't have a pro-life conservative candidate. So given that there was no pro-life conservative candidate, I voted for the most winnable pro-life candidate, even though like they were pulling at 2% and that's basically what they got, which was PPC. And Alyssa, I mean, I don't, I don't want to speak for you, but that was, you had a similar experience for yourself. Did you not? Yeah. I mean, my, my, my uh, conservative candidate here in Calgary is such a dud, been in forever, doesn't do anything, just sits around, votes the wrong way. Uh, never hear a peep from him except when you're fundraising. I too hate the fundraising calls. Just a tip for anyone listening. If they call you, you can just ask them to put you on the do not call list and they won't bug you again. <laughs> But if but if you ignore them over and over, they will like incessantly call you. Like they won't yes. stop. Like, but, never. but never do that. Never do that for calls from CCPR and right now. Yeah, 
<laughs> only, exactly. for, only from political parties. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, I definitely voted PPC. I made that pretty public. Um, and I have no regrets doing that. Uh, I will get involved, though, if there's a nomination race in conservative for the conservative party. It's a very it's going to go conservative every time. So if I can be involved in the nomination race and get a better candidate in there, that's exactly what I'll do. And Canada is not like the U.S. Like in the U.S., you can directly vote for who the president is going to be here. The only way that we have any say as to who the prime minister is going to be is specifically and purely through leadership races. So even if you don't don't support a certain party, it doesn't mean that you can't be involved in the, in having a say as who's to who is going to lead the country. And I think that's a very important thing that everyone, all pro-lifers and just, you know, conservatives in general should remember, um, whether they're part of the conservative party or not, that statistically, the conservative party is the highest, uh, most likely party to win in, a, in an election. So let's have our voices heard about who the leader is going to be and who the prime minister is going to be. Because if we don't make our voices heard, then those who don't agree with us will. And that's ultimately who will always win and continuously win. You know, our, our friend uh, Fertine Grisecki from um, For My Canada, she brings up a really good point um, in her presentation that she's using for the leadership race um, that's happening right now. And she says that, you know, if you look at uh, Justin Trudeau, when he was elected as leader of the Liberal Party back in uh, 2013, which is almost 10 years ago, the amount of Canadians that participated in that leadership race compared to as a proportion of the amount of Canadians overall is something like 0.2%. So 0.2% of Canadians actually got involved in that leadership race for the Liberal Party of Canada, decided who the leader was going to be, Justin Trudeau, and that's why he is elected as Prime Minister within the House of Commons. So the percentage of people who decide who likely is going to chair cabinet meetings, which is a huge amount of power in this country, probably more so than like the president of the United States has, or most presidents of most republics, is a very small percentage of the population. Uh, I can guarantee you that, you know, a probably a good chunk of people who voted for uh, Justin Trudeau as a liberal leader didn't necessarily vote liberal all the way through. That's, that's you know, on Justin Trudeau, not necessarily on them. So, um, same thing for the conservatives. You know, you you, you could go in kind of as a skeptic, I suppose, maybe someone who didn't vote conservative last time. Maybe you're not going to vote conservative next time because your candidate is not pro-life, which is understandable. And there's a pro-life candidate in your riding. But you can vote for a pro-life leadership contestant. And that does make a mathematical difference. And it's important for the reason that Alyssa just said, because there is a really good chance, especially in the next election, when the liberals would have been in power for almost a decade, uh, the Conservative Party of Canada is likely to form the next government. So whether or not you're going to vote for a Conservative candidate in your riding, wouldn't it be great to have someone who is pro-life, who wants to reduce the abortion rate, who wants to uh, re reduce the assisted suicide rate, chairing cabinet meetings? Like, I would just think that that is self-explanatory and self-evident, I would hope. Absolutely. I, I know that we're, we're starting to wrap up here. And I know I'm sure that I'm cracking open a can of worms right now uh, with the Jason Kenny question. But I, I want to ask, like, when it comes to engaging with Les and Lewis, like, like, I'm sure there's a million reasons why Jason Kenny has been so disappointing in Alberta. Um, let's not super get into that necessarily. I'm sure we can talk about that after we're done the recording. But um, I've, uh, where where is the role in pro-lifers actually showing up to her events, actually engaging with her, talking to her, um, donating towards her campaign, all that kind of stuff, getting involved actively and not just like a passive, okay, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna put Leslie Lewis on the top of my ballot. Okay, you guys won me over, but I'm not gonna bother showing up to anything. I'm not gonna bother um, sharing any of her content or anything like that. I'm not going to bother engaging at all because she's already got my vote. Where's the value in pro-lifers actually engaging with these kind of candidates so that they stay true to their values so that we make it as easy as possible for them to be able to point towards a massive base of social conservatives and not a bunch of people that, that think that, um, Leslie Lewis is going to single-handedly overhaul this entire nation and turn it back into a, a Christian theocracy sort of thing. Like, how, how do we make sure that, that she has the support that she needs in a very real way with, with who is showing up and who's in her ear and all that kind of stuff? Um, what do we need to do on that front? 
Yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting, the Jason Kenny connection, because I think he was actually instrumental in finding uh, Leslie Lewis and encouraging her to join uh, politics in general, um, and has always been very encouraging of her, which I'm thankful for. Um, but I mean, both Jason and Leslin are very... Uh, personally pro-life. How they go about it is uh, very different. Um, but I will say that both are, you know, I think that Jason Kenney still has more kind of pro-life policies and pro-life sentiments in his speeches and stuff than any other <laughs> premier in Canada. So although we expect more from him because we know that he's pro-life and Catholic and all these things, he still is doing more than anybody else is doing. Um, I will say that. But so I think just nurturing what's already there um, and, uh, you know, with with Leslin, she does have these policies. She does say that what, what she's going to do with the no hidden agenda. Um, but it's always good to, to keep communication, to keep a, to build a relationship. So the best thing that people can do right now is to go to their campaign events, to go to Leslin's campaign events, to show support um, and to encourage others who might kind of be on the fence about the conservative party or Leslin or all of the above and go to the, go to the events, see what she has to say. And, uh, and then if she does get elected to just, you know, a big thing too, is an encouragement. Like when these, when Jason Kenney talks about the unborn baby in his throne speech to write to him and say, thank you for doing that. Thank you for putting forward this adoption policy. Like I, I support you because if all he ever hears from social conservatives is you suck, you don't do enough. Babies are dying. You're responsible. Like it's not going to do much for him politically. Um, but he, you know, I, so, so I think developing and building these relationships with these politicians, especially the ones who are very open about doing that is the best way uh, to, to ensure that they keep their word. But again, you know, I'll, with Aaron O'Toole and, and other conservatives who have talked about putting forward pro-life policy, they weren't personally pro-life. They didn't really have an investment, a personal investment. The other poli- These other two politicians do. Um, and also, lastly, the best other way to um, encourage these pro-life politicians or leaders in, is to elect more pro-life politicians because the greater the pro-life caucus is, the greater the influence that they have, the more likely they'll become cabinet ministers and oversee different public policies that way. So um, getting involved in the nomination and election process is key after the leadership race as well. All right. I have one final question and I know it's an impossible question, but we do want to see how good you are at foreseeing the future. Um, I'll start with you, Scott, then on to you, Alyssa. What are your predictions for the conservative party uh, race for the leader leadership like final outcome final outcome <clears throat> i think uh, on the current trajectory so this is gonna be a long answer sorry it's just the way it is um i think on the current trajectory uh this is this is peers to lose and I, I think there there is a potentiality that that could happen uh mostly because uh what Lessa said earlier that he seems to be playing to the existing party base and that and, and, and existing party membership and that might be the right play for him as of today you know Hamish Marshall and Jenny Byrne might be going through the numbers they're not dumb people and they might make the calculation that listen for the resources that we're we're gathering for the people that we have within our our campaign it makes more sense and we have a higher return on investment to get all current party members out to these events and to accept that base so that we just dominate that base and it doesn't really matter who who sells uh, memberships amongst the other leadership contestants uh, because we're going to have uh, you know 80 percent of existing members with which like 60 percent are going to come out and vote the numbers are just too high um, and if the membership race doesn't or, or, or within the leadership race if the membership numbers don't increase by a good amount like a, like a really healthy amount um, then uh, they're, they're they're probably right the risk of that is what if it does grow what what if Patrick Brown is out there quietly which is probably the case going to all these gurdwaras all these mosques selling uh, memberships in suburban Montreal Brampton Surrey Forest Lawn um, and, and getting, you know, deep into those ridings, into those 30, 40 ridings. What if Leslie Lewis is going across the country, you know, having all these sales captains, membership sales captains in different churches and different ridings across the country selling, you know, 5, 10, 15, 50, 100 memberships each over the next, you know, two months? It, it changes the name of the game. And then the fact of the matter is that everyone gets all, all the leadership contestants who are going to be on the ballot. They get that list 
come June 3rd, which is a membership sales cutoff. So everyone can talk to everyone. And unlike the last two leadership races, uh, the amount of time between when the, the leadership contestants get that full membership list and when the ballots actually have to be submitted to the party to be counted is the longest amount of time ever in the history of the party. So you have a very long persuasion period. So my prediction, given what I know about the different campaigns, what my friends in the different campaigns are telling me, is I do believe that uh, Pierre will come out on top on the first ballot. You'll have Leslin as a strong second that a lot of people in the media aren't quite picking up yet, but they probably will as time goes on. I think you'll have Patrick Brown as third, Jean Charest as fourth, and then I don't really know what happens after that. Uh, someone for like Roman Baber, like he really, really needs COVID to still be a thing in two months, and I just don't think it will be, especially if the federal government just lets the interprovincial uh, travel mandates um, kind of dissipate into the night. So if that's the case, then we call, do the down ballot thing. And if Patrick Brown's out there selling to a bunch of religious ethnic communities, which are probably going to be the most accessible to someone like Leslie Lewis, um, you know, down ballot, I think things can get really interesting. And I do believe you're going to see a situation which we saw last time, which was Leslin almost on the final ballot. I think she will be on the final ballot um, in this case. I don't know how that's going to play out. And I think it really comes to, is Leslin going to be within five percentage points of Pierre Poliver on that final ballot or not? If she is, I think she overtakes him. If she isn't, you know, she's kind of five to 10. It's a little more tough. If he has a 10% or greater margin, then I think he, he wins it, although not by a huge margin. Sorry for the long-winded answer to such a short, simple question. <laughs> No, that is okay. Alyssa, you're on the same page or where are you? Oh, no, I think Pierre will win it on the first ballot. I'm just kidding. (laughs) Um, That's what they want you to believe. But uh, yeah, I definitely agree with Scott. I think um, there'll be a lot of other... um, There'll be a lot of other things at play, like is has her French improved? Um, will she be able to get more support in Quebec? Um, I I think that will be the case. Um, and also, how many uh, candidates will end up being on the final ballot? Will it just be the four? Will there be like seven or twelve or whatever? Because that'll make a difference too. But um, I do think that she'll be on the final ballot, and uh, I think that it's not going to be the coronation or even the easy win that everyone's saying that it will be right now. All right. Thank you so much for that. As I mentioned off the top. Wait, you- wait, wait, whoa, whoa. What, what are your guys' predictions? <laughs> that, uh, I, don't think, I don't think you can just get away with that. Uh, it's easy to get. It's our show. So, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll start Cam and then, and then you, can, uh, you can go after that. For someone who's not very invested, like I, I don't have put a lot of time investment into following the leadership race. Um, I would probably agree it'll be between Leslin and Pierre. Um, really hoping that the things we talked about today are, are going to pick up certainly in our communities, uh, you know, the sort of the social conservative communities that we inhabit. Um, but right now I think Pierre is, is on top. He has got the most sort of support and excitement uh, surrounding his campaign. Um, so if it happens today, I would go with him. Um, it'll, I hope it's tight with him and Pierre with him and Leslin, but my final guess is probably going to be Pierre. Cool. I'm going to be the the optimist here on on I I honestly obviously I see that the peers ahead right now, but I just based on the number of politicians that end up contacting CCBR, acknowledging that pro lifers are the hardest working political aides that are out there. I I genuinely think that that there is a and, and like this is very much obviously due to the work that you guys are doing it right now, right? Like we have politicians reaching out to us asking us to lit drop for them or door knock for them or whatever because they get that we actually care enough to be able to prioritize this in our schedules Mm -hmm. and i genuinely think that there will be the the hardest workers in this political um arena this leadership race are going to be the social conservatives because they see not only the opportunity that leslin presents but also um how bad things were with not only Stephen Harper, but more recently, Aaron O'Toole. And I think that that motivation is going to drive us a little bit more, the complacency from Pierre Polyver. Um, I, I think it'd be very, very reasonable to think that Leslin could pull this out, so long as people do actually step up to the plate. And I know that that's probably where we're all at, but I, I feel like I'm a little bit more optimistic just because I know a lot of the people, the seeing more and more familiar faces whenever I go out to these rallies that Leslin or um, other folks are doing, I feel like there's a much better political network of social conservatives that have been cultivated because of the work of right now over the last five years or so. And because of that, 
I, I'm a little bit more optimistic, I suppose. And, and maybe that's because I'm not quite as literate on the numbers of politics as the three of you are. But but I, I genuinely think that based on the people involved and the volume of people involved, that that, that is going to make tremendous grounds over the next six months, I suppose. And I will say, like, people were caught completely off guard when Leslin announced that she was the first candidate on the ballot. Like, she fundraised her $300,000. Yeah. She got everything in. And Pierre announced at least a month before everyone. So maybe they didn't focus on it. Maybe they're focusing on other things. Whatever the case may be, Leslin had the organizational skills and the financial support um, to get her her name first on, on the ballot. And uh, it's really funny to go on Twitter and see the responses of kind of red Tories because they're like, oh, these social conservative fanatics and yeah i am a social conservative fanatic yeah i'm gonna donate and i'm gonna support and i'm gonna get leslin to where she needs to be so you know you can call me whatever you like but if that's gonna get her ahead of uh the other ones then so be it perfect well here's to leslin winning Mm -hmm. um final question here uh we mentioned off the top you guys work for right now doing a lot of work in uh well every election that takes place seeking to elect pro-life legislators, pro-life leaders. Um, how can people reach out to you? How can people get a hold of you? And, and uh, what sort of things can they expect in terms of communication um, on how they can get involved? Um, text message, email, where are we at? Hit it, Alyssa. <laughs> This is your bread and butter. Well, you can find us on uh, our website. It starts right now.ca. You can find us on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook, slash right now HQ at H at right now HQ. Um, and yeah, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to connect with you if you're interested in being a membership captain. Um, and just please buy a membership, regardless of whether you love the conservatives or hate the conservatives, have a say. This is a pivotal time in, in political history for the pro-life movement, so don't let it go to waste. Are we are we not on the TikTok? The Just TikTok. Me. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> the TikTok. We have, to, we have to fix that. I don't know. Well, it's really funny. What are we paying you for? It's really funny because I hated TikTok. Are you are you, CCBR is on TikTok? Yeah. 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 When we when we all shut down, I started a TikTok account, but I tried to get out of that as quick as possible. So we have an account, but it hasn't been used in a while. Well, my, my short TikTok story is that I didn't want to spend too much time on it for right now, but I was making personal videos on occasion, like of my baby or my dog or something. And it had like 10 views, like it was really lame. But then like the mandate stuff started happening and I was getting more impassioned about it. So I started making TikTok videos about it. And at least one, if not two of my videos have over a million views. And I have now 10,000 followers on TikTok. But now that the mandate stuff has sort of dropped, I'm like, where do you what am I going to talk about now? <laughs> so, <laughs> Sell the memberships. Yeah, I'm going to like try to convert them on the pro-life thing because, uh, yeah, it, it'll be uh, – I'll go back to the pro-life videos. But, yeah, TikTok is uh, an interesting beast that I haven't yet fully conquered. But I know a lot of people are on it, so it's important that pro-lifers go where the people are. That's for sure. <laughs> Yeah, Jagmeet Singh is on there. I don't know I if know. you've seen him, but he's yeah. pretty invested in reaching that ju- that sort of group of people. I just have to say one thing. Uh, I had a video that went viral on TikTok, which was fantastic. So if our listeners want to find it uh, and you're on TikTok, which um, is a waste of your time, most likely. <laughs> um, but if you're on TikTok, before you get rid of it, do go to end, at end the killing and find that viral video and uh, enjoy a good laugh. Um, Scott and Alyssa, thank you so much for taking the time and joining us today. Thanks, Thanks for having, having us. us. That was Scott Hayward and Alyssa Globe, founders of Right Now. We want you to check out their website. It uh, the, the website is itstartsrightnow.ca, itstartsrightnow.ca to get involved in the work that they are doing, electing, um, in this case, Leslin Lewis, who we are excited about. I know that they answered a lot of the questions I have, a lot of the questions that I've been posed with. And I hope we can. Uh, I hope you can say the same as well. That some of the questions you may have had about this leadership race have been touched on in this episode. If they haven't, uh, do let us know about that because we do want to have Scott and Alyssa on closer to the date of uh, when the election is going to be happening. Um, so if there are more things that you're you're wondering about, concerned about, uh, not really sure about, you can send us an email uh, by filling out our contact form on our website, prolifeguys.com, or you can send us a message on any one of the apps that we use. Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just search the Pro-Life Guys podcast and you will most likely find us. Um, so send us a message there. And anything anything else as well, any thoughts, any questions, any concerns, any suggested guests or suggested topics, 
that you would like, whatever it might be, feel free to reach out. Uh, we will get back to you at as soon as possible. One more reminder, uh, as we wrap this up of the upcoming course that, uh, that Cam will be running, become an effective advocate, learn how to engage with people on different sides of the issue. Um, when it comes to abortion, uh, by signing up for this upcoming course and the upcoming roundtable that we talked about focusing on the history of the pro-life movement. And the guests are going to be talking about that as well. We had a fantastic roundtable last time where uh, our participants, those who joined, folks just like you, um, were able to ask questions of some of the leaders that we had on uh, at that point. And we want that format to be similar for the upcoming roundtable again. So you will have an opportunity to ask some questions, uh, share some thoughts, meet uh, a few of your pro-life heroes, hopefully the pro-life heroes of yours. If they're not, uh, hopefully they will be after that round table. You can sign up by going to patreon.com slash pro-life guys. It's a perk for our Patreon supporters. Thank you so much for tuning in. With that, we, uh, we will wrap this up. We hope you tune in again next time. <laughs>